memory tumors. Okay, so that's what it looks like. So it is. Um, it can be quite obvious. It can be quite um, dramatic. And same again. In my experience, memory tumors they are. They can, and this is not a testicle. This is a caudal memory gland. That is huge. So that one there. Yep. So uh, mixed tumors. So in my experience, not all memory tumors are, are malignant, and some of them are mixed. So it's not uncommon for them to have a benign and a malignant. And it certainly doesn't equate to size. I've seen huge tumors, benign. Whew. X-rays all show nothing, come back benign. Remove that, and oh sorry. Then after that, uh, small tumors, malignant. Then you check the chest, then there's something wrong over there. So, and the next question would be, ethical question, if it's entire, do I spade after? So to speak. Because we know memory tumors, the, there's a higher chance of them getting it or it developing because of the sex hormones, so to speak. So what, what's, what's greater risk, memory tumors or pyometra? Or oh, pyometra. Yeah. Hands down, pyometra. Yeah, pyometra. Yeah. So memory tumor is not as common, but uh, especially malignant memory tumor, mm -hmm. not as common. So in my experience, it's almost like a third. Benign makes malignant memory tumors, so to speak. But then again, it is when I say benign, it doesn't, it's not really benign because if it's huge, it's dragging on the floor, it's ulcerated, it's painful, it's rotten, it's inflamed, it's infected. Benign means it doesn't spread, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't cause any harm. That's the biggest problem people keep thinking. When I say benign, oh, it's harmless. No, it can be a huge tumor that's benign, it still causes discomfort to the animal. It's rotted, it's, you know, and it can be the smallest malignant tumor, but it's still malignant because it's spread. So to speak. So don't don't, don't get misjudged, but uh, don't, don't get a uh, sort of a uh, confused by the phrase. Yeah. Um, so this is one ulcerated one. I don't know if you can see, but it's pus coming from the middle. And um, in my experience, 50/50 um, as well. Ulcerated tumors, benign, uh, malignant. It's just that the cell is just really dying inside there already, so it just starts rotting. <coughs> okay, pyometra. This is what a healthy spay womb looks like, and that is what a pyometra looks like. Okay, so it's just two bags of pus inside there. I can't find any easier way to describe it. It's literally two bags of pus inside there. And usually, usually there is what we call um, the, in my experience, it happens after the season, anything between two weeks to 12 weeks. Okay, cl usual clinical signs is drinking more than usual, weighing more than usual because of the infection, um, and uh, sometimes the owners also talk about a uh, the dog having pus from the vagina. What is all classic ones? Okay, so there's open and closed pio. Okay, so open pio means the cervix is open, so it's draining pus. Okay, to a certain extent, that is better. Okay, compared to a closed pio, a closed pio means cervix is closed. The pus is just building up inside there. There's no draining at all. So um, sometimes owner says, "Oh no, but there's no pus over there. Oh, it, it cannot be. Is, it, oh, is it a better pile? Because I don't see any pus coming out. No, if it's pile open. It's probably better. Okay. And sometimes they can be present with normal temperature. So not all of them temperatures. Sometimes they can present with happiness. They're running around like nobody's business. Sometimes when I do a normal spay, I find a pile. <laughs> yes." It's one of those things, okay? And that's where I gotta get, okay, I'm gonna get a little bit technical in this, okay? So a pyometra means pus in a womb, infected womb. A mucometra means mucus in a womb, not not exactly pyo. So I suspect those so, so-called normal, uh, we, we didn't check, but the, all those sort of normal space that we did that came out to be a pyo, uh, or seemingly pyo, it could well just uh, be mucometra. So it's still filled, but it's just mucus inside there, rather than pus. But certainly, pyometra is very, very common. Uh, in my experience, I have removed one that is like this 4.5 kilos of pus. That was from a, that was from that was that was even a big dog. It was a, it was a Springer. This dog was huge, and I just came in. I was like, and just came in. You know, the owner is saying, "Oh, I was drinking more than usual for the past sort of four weeks," and there's a bit of pus coming. I'm like, okay, and, uh, so we removed it, and you know, 4.5 kilos. So it's huge, and uh, so all I'm saying is that you know. Sometimes it can be quite dramatic, and it itself is a life-threatening condition, because I, uh, that is where we talk about. Because if you can imagine the anatomy, if you've got pus over there, it can uptrack, push into the kidneys. 
So I've seen dogs with kidney failure uh, with Pyometra. So um, my take on that, how I sort of discuss that with the owners is usually, look, if you spay the dog, we do a normal spay, it'll cost X amount of money, we get everything out, that's it. If I do a Pyometra, it's a whole different ball game. I'm still gonna spay a dog, but I'm gonna be running blood tests. There's a high risk of kidney failure. There's gonna be a fluid, antibiotics, the procedure is so much more difficult because you're removing something that is 10 times the size it's going to be much, much more expensive, your call, so to speak. Once we get in the pyometra, you do blood tests and things like that. And that is, and I still can't guarantee you a live dog in the end. So it's not unusual for us to lose the patient under anesthesia. Now you're wanting to anesthetize a sick dog with kidney issues. Your anesthetic risk goes up much higher than anesthetizing a healthy dog. So a lot of things come to play. Look at the bad boy. We're still talking about dogs here, not horses, yeah? <laughs> so, yeah, that's, pyo that's a pyometra. Like, this one needs two surgeons to carry it so it doesn't rupture. Can you imagine when a pyometra ruptures, when we're still doing surgery, all the pus goes back into the belly, it becomes a peritonitis. Whole different ball game again. It's like, why do we want to do this sort of things? Why do we want to subject a, sur why do we want to subject a surgeon to do this sort of things? And they go, you know, just spay the dog, just like any other spay. No, it's not any other spay. <laughs> There is a lot of pus involved. <laughs>